Hello and welcome back to Friday morning. It is March the 27th, 2020. This is the last day that we'll be doing um, our normal routine of uh, each morning having the assignment at around noonish. Um, we'll resume this on uh, the following Monday coming up here. So whenever I make this assignment, you'll have until Monday at noon to finish this. So let's go over the answers to yesterday's questions. Uh, these are some fun ones. I like these. Um, let's see here. So it says, if Colin can wrap a gift in 18 seconds, how many minutes will it take him to wrap 100 gifts? So hopefully we can mentally do this very quickly of 100 times 18 being 1,800. Okay. Now we've got 1,800 seconds and we need to convert that into minutes. Well, we're going to take 1,800 and divide it by 60. Oh, sorry. Divide it by 60. Okay. 60 does not go into 1. It does not go into 18, but it does go into 180. 6 goes into 180 three times because I know that 6 goes into 18 three times. Now, 3 times 60 is 180. And this comes out nice because um, since there is nothing left over, 180 minus 180 is 0. Bring the 0 down, 60 goes into 0 exactly 0 times. Means that it will take him 30 minutes to wrap 100 gifts. This guy must be like a wrapping machine that is really fast. So, moving on. I think I'm getting better at using the stylus and knowing that it just goes up with the next one. Let's get rid of this. Okay, it says, this week Rudy began saving his $5 weekly allowance to buy a new gaming system. How many weeks worth of allowance must Rudy save to buy a gaming system that cost $299? Well, we know that $299 is not a multiple of five because it does not end in a zero, right? So we do know that one up from 299 is 300. He's going to have to earn at least 300 bucks because, you know, if he earns $295, it's not going to be enough. He's going to have to wait another week. So let's just go ahead and divide 300 by 5, not 299, because we know we're going to have to work that extra week. So if you take 300 divided by 5, maybe this kid could get a part-time job or something, because this is going to take a long time. 5 goes into uh, 3, 0 times. 5 goes into 30, 6 times. Okay, six times five is 30, you get nothing left, um, and bring the zero down. Five goes into zero, zero times. Whoa, this guy is going to have to wait quite a while to get his gaming system. That is going to be over a year before he gets it. So I'd say he probably either needs to ask for more allowance or get a part-time job. That's going to take a while. You could also think of it as like, well, 5 times 10 is 50. And how many 50s are there in 300? Well, there's six 50s. So there's going to be 6 times 10, which is 60 weeks. Whoa. Good luck. Okay. Here we go. A certain game board. love this problem. A certain game board consists of an N by N array of squares. Basically, it's a, it's a square with both sides being equal. Vijay, Vijay uh, places a token on every square that does not border an edge of the board. If Vijay uses exactly 169 tokens, what is the value of N? So it might be helpful to draw a picture of what they're trying to, to do here. So basically, we know the area of this inside um, square, inside of this larger square. And we know that we don't count the outside ones, right? But we do know that this is 169 tokens, okay? So that means that some number times some number is 169. Now, in this case, it has to be the same number times the same number, which means we need to find the square root of 169. Now you can do that on your calculator. What you do is you take 169 and you push the square root button and it should or should give you the answer of 13. Okay, so you should also know your squares. I think it's really helpful to know your squares all the way up to 20. 
it's really helpful and it's going to be useful for the rest of your schooling. So this is not the answer. That is this, right? That means that I have to add one token on this side, one token on this side that would give me the full board. So if I add one to um, this side of 13, so this is 13, I add one up here and I add one down here, I get 15. Okay, the value of n is 15. Moving on, next, how many minutes are there in half a day? Well, a day is 24. Oh, sorry, 24 hours, okay? Let's figure out how many hours there are in half a day. So we're gonna divide this by two, which gives us 12. Okay, so 12 hours is in half a day. Now I'm gonna take that 12, and I'm going to multiply by 60 because there are 60 minutes in um, in one hour. Now we could do this algorithmically. To try that. 12 and 60. Okay. I know that this first line would all be zeros, so I'm not even going to do it. I'm going to just start the first line with a zero. Gives me 12. That gives me seven which is 720. Or you could also see that 12 times six is 72, and then multiply that by your 10 in the 60, which should give you 720. So there are 720 minutes in half a day. Excellent, moving on. Let me erase this a little bit. Okay. All right, back to percentages. The Sharks have a win-loss record of 36 and 14, meaning that they have won 36 and they have lost 14. Okay, you always express your wins first and your losses second. What percent of the games played have the Sharks won? Now, there's a couple of ways you could do this. Before, I said that percent means per 100. Well, you first have to figure out how many games they've played total. And in this case, we have 36 and 14. Well, these are nice numbers to work with because 36 plus 14 is 50. Okay? Now, we could take 50 and make it into a fraction. So we have 50 as our denominator, and then we have 36 as our numerator. Okay? Now, once again, the fractional way of doing this is figuring out how many over... 100 is it and the numerator will be our percent so if i multiply 50 times 2 that gives me 100 and if i multiply 36 times 2 that gives me 72 it gives me 72 percent or the other way you could do it is taking 36 and dividing that by 50. then that's going to give you the decimal answer of 0.72. Now, in order to convert uh, a decimal answer into a percent, we move it to the right twice or multiply it by 100, which once again gives us 72%. All right, moving on to this really cool lesson on um, Eastern Washington lava flows. You know, I, I, I put this one in there between two of our lessons in mystery science because I think it's so fascinating, the geology in Eastern Washington. It is truly a unique place in the world. Okay, it says, um, so if you watch the YouTube video, you should be able to answer these. It says, did the giant lava flows in Eastern Washington come from our state's largest volcano? Well, hopefully you know our largest volcano is Mount Rainier, but this lava did not come from Mount Rainier. It did not. The lava is in far eastern Washington, quite a bit of ways from Mount Rainier, uh, at least the bulk of it. Okay, number two, what fraction of our state was covered by these massive lava flows? One third of our state was covered completely in lava, which is now thick layers of basalt. It completely erased the topography of large areas of our state. It would be really amazing to see what that looked like before these ancient lava flows. Okay, and if you've ever been to Eastern Washington, I really encourage you. There's a place called uh, George uh, Washington, interestingly. It's in Eastern Washington over uh, just off of I-5. 
and there is this really cool um, place called Frenchman's Coulee. I used to go rock climbing there, but you can see here these, oh, sorry, these towers. Oh, keeps, oh, these towers we see here are, oh, stop letting me. Okay, but these towers here you see on the right are 100, 150 feet tall, and those are basalt columns, and it is absolutely gorgeous. It's pretty, and it's also amazing, you know, amazing from a geological perspective. So, next time you're in Eastern Washington, take a look at that. And, oh, that's tomorrow's assignment. Uh, finally, or number three, about how long ago is that these lava flows happen in Eastern Washington? Well, it was somewhere between 17 and 15 million years ago. We can make those estimates through different kinds of geological studies. Then at the same time, we can count the number of distinct lava flows that have happened during that time. And scientists, geologists, the person who studies rocks is called a geologist, estimate that it happened about 300 times. Wow, that would have been really, really cool to see from a safe distance, obviously. And then finally, where did the lava come from? Well, there's this word called a fissure. And a fissure is another word for a crack. And it wasn't actually a volcano. It was a large crack in eastern Washington that flowed lava over the surface of eastern Washington for 2 million years. Really fascinating. There's really cool books that you can get on the geology of Washington. Um, Whenever you drive through eastern Washington, there's lots of places you can stop and see evidence of this. And so we can continue this discussion more, but that was it for today. I hope everybody's doing well and you enjoy a restful and um, uh, hopefully staying a little active outside as well weekend. And I will talk to you guys again on Monday. Bye-bye.